Welcome to Raising the Bar, the podcast that pulls back the curtain on the country's most successful leaders and how they elevate their business and their teams. Please welcome our host, Alison DePauli. Welcome to the latest episode of Raising the Bar podcast, where we talk with CEOs and COOs who have raised the bar professionally. It is my pleasure today to introduce you to serial entrepreneur, Alan Griever, who has a new enterprise launching right about the time that we launched this episode and um, has been a serial entrepreneur in some really interesting mission-driven entities. So thank you for being with me today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you're always so interesting to me. We've known each other for a long time, but you were an entrepreneur. Then you went to work for Microsoft and then you found your way back to entrepreneurship. You've written a few books along the way. What was your favorite experience? Wow. That is, that is a hard one. Um, You know, I, I think I think my very first company, because, you know, you always remember your first, I, I, that was just a, a really special place. It was called Flash Creative Management. We ran it for 15 years. We grew it. We only had a handful of people leave over 15 years. Like, we, we just caught lightning in a bottle. Everybody loved being there. We're all still close. And uh, so I, I think that was probably number one f- followed closely by um, helping to start the billing team at Microsoft Mm -hmm. that does all the billing for Office 365, Windows, Azure, Xbox Live. I mean, there were six of us to start. It was an entrepreneurial effort, but with $40 billion in the bank, which is (laughs) kind of a nice way to do it. Um, But, you know, we went from six of us to, you know, 1,200 people over a couple of years and, and, you know, zero revenue to doing over a billion a month and, and just, just insane, something that you can only scale that fast really at a company like Microsoft. And we were given so much freedom to do what was right and to just move things forward. And it was just, uh, just a great experience. So you've had a couple of other ventures since then. Um, Mm -hmm. And it, when I look at those entities, it looks like you applied that, use your brain, I'll support you, um, management style into each of those entities as well. Does that make you more profitable? You know, I, I, well, I've never tried it the other way, so I'm not sure, but, you <laughs> know, I, I've... Early, before I started my first company, um, both my partner then and I both worked for people who were not, let's just say we're not nice. And and they both managed to drive their companies into the ground. And, and David, my partner in the first business, and I were like, you know, we could probably drive our company into the ground and be nice at the same time. So why don't we try that? And, <laughs> and it worked really well, right? So... I mean, I I love growing people, you know, as you know, my current Mm -hmm. uh, uh, effort that is launching now is a staffing company, which is kind of odd for someone who loves growing people and, and, you know, helping them out. But we have a twist on it that we're hoping will change the industry. And and it's quite a twist. And it goes back to that being mission driven, I think. And and I think so it's so easy to get off mission driven. But when you're true to that, you really can make some remarkable changes. And I think you have here. Thank you. I I mean, whatever you'd like to. Yeah. So, you know, the I've my first business was a consulting company, right? And, mm-hmm. and consulting companies, you take over the entire project and and you communicate very closely to your customer. And, you know, it, it's, it can be wildly profitable um, if you do a good job, right? But you also have this other effort, which is a, a typical contingent staffing company where they just take people and they place them in at the clients and the clients run the show and you're not responsible for the outcomes as much. You're just responsible for finding the people and hoping that they're good enough that the client wants to keep them. 
But because of that, a lot of staffing companies have, have gained a really bad reputation of not caring about their people, right? Uh -huh. You don't hear from them after you're hired. They try to hire people on 1099 so they don't have to give any benefits. Uh -huh. um, if, if the project ends, they don't keep people on the bench like a consulting firm will try to do. They'll actually typically fire them and then rehire them if they get another project for someone. Yeah. Um, we're doing things differently. Everyone we work with is W-2. They're an employee of ours. Mm -hmm. We offer killer benefits. We basically want to offer, you know, Microsoft Google style benefits to our people. So 100% healthcare, vision and dental, including for their families, mm -hmm. uh, you know, retirement with a decent sized match. 50% uh, of our profits goes back to our people. So they have a share in what's going on. We're an open book company, not only with our people, but also with our clients. So they both know how much they're getting paid, what their benefits are like, and how much is being billed. So they know we're not taking 65% of the, the pocket, right? Yep. Um, and at the same time, because coach staffing is part of a longer lived group uh, called the code group, which is actually celebrating its 30th anniversary in uh, December this coming year, this year. Um, we also offer things like through other pieces of it, things like code training and code consulting. So we can work, work with a client to help set technical direction. We can train our people and theirs. And we are looking for a long-term customer intimate relationship with the clients where we are deeply embedded with them and working with our people, growing them. I can tell you all the people we've brought on board during our test period now, I know what their career goals are. We're working towards them. We're finding them mentors across the industry to help them grow. You know, it's, it's all the stuff I love to do with people, but brought to an industry that hasn't done it before. And our hope is if we're wildly successful, we're gonna force the other staffing companies to start providing similar types of benefits. You, most of your ventures have, have meant to improve a particular thing. You've taken the staffing idea and your, your staffing is technical staffing, IT kind of staffing. So you, you're dealing with many different kinds of skills that are I mean, yes, it's IT, you know, to me, IT is IT, but that isn't really accurate. You know, That's IT correct. is many different things and many different skill sets. But mm -hmm. by, a, by granting, by having such a good training resource, you literally can help somebody evolve their career entirely. Yes. And in fact, we're, one of the things we want to do with training is, even start providing introductory level classes on programming, et cetera, and then take some of those graduates and also bring them in and find them their first jobs in the industry and help them grow. And, and I think, um, so I have a somebody in my orbit who is the third generation owner of a business and 40% of their staff has been with them for more than 20 years. And their business is very, very different. Um, and I hear the same things. I hear, we ask about people. We ask for ideas. We teach people. We train people. We move them through our organizations. They may come in here, but end up here, or they may start here and they want to go over here and we help them find a way to get there. We help them off and on, right? So they may have cir mm -hmm. a circumstance where they need to either reduce their hours or leave, but they help them come back. And, right. and you know, obviously maybe somebody you're like, okay, goodbye, thank you. But for a lot of people, they want their people back. And we have another, organ uh, another uh, organization in San Antonio that the the books of the business are transparent to the senior leadership team everybody knows what everybody gets paid what their benefits are the financial performance of the company the budget for every division in the organization and it creates such a difference in the leadership team 
why do you think that more organizations don't do that? Because we, we don't have a lot that do that. And we have a nice number of clients. You know, I have no, no idea. I, I think I think people have been, well, I think part of it was because corporations typically frowned on anybody sharing what kind of salary they get, et cetera, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, this is something we started at, at you know, the first uh, uh, consulting company that I had back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, we just found that, you know, the more we opened up, the more we trained people in different things. I mean, we had classes on etiquette so that our people would know how to go to dinner with the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. And the more we did that kind of stuff, the, the less we had to focus on the business, Right. And and I remember one time my, my partner, David, who's, who's still one of my best friends in the world, um, he always watched the books very carefully. Right. He sent out every single invoice himself, et cetera. And finally, we convinced him to take his family on a three week vacation to Europe. So he did. What I didn't tell him until just before they left was I was taking mine on a three-week vacation there too. So suddenly the two owners were gone. And we said to our people, we said, look, here are the things we care about. This is pre-internet, all of that stuff, right? We had modems so we could dial in and see some, you know, very slowly see some uh, Excel spreadsheets or whatever. And... uh, you know, we just told them, look, here's what we need to do. And we got back. Everything was in shape. They had closed more business than we ever had. They had built clients, they had told the clients, hey, David and Yag are, you know, are in Europe. If you pay us quicker, we'll really show them. And the clients paid faster, right? <laughs> it was it was just an amazing thing. And, and that helped us to, you know, say, okay, we got to, we got to give our people even more, um, more capabilities, more put them more in charge because we're obviously holding them back. So that's what we did. I find that we we have a smaller team, but I find that as I'm I'm just like, you can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, that more things happen and everything improves. And I got to tell you, our customers love it. They're like, yeah, we don't need you. Kind of the goal. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, I've I've got this. I just hired this this woman in our company as an account manager for our largest client, and I asked her what her goal is. She said she wants to be a, to understand how to create and run her own company. I was like, that is awesome. I am your mentor. I am going to just keep loading stuff on you and explaining to you why. And her first two weeks at the company, we had a one-on-one every day where I talked about everything that we were doing and the philosophy behind it. So that if she understands our mission and vision Mm -hmm. and the philosophy, she will make the right decisions. Yep. And then I don't have to be involved. And, and, you know, my goal is if we sit here talking in 20 years, besides the fact that I'll, you know, walking with a cane or whatever, um, (laughs) You know, my goal is that all of the same people that we have today will still be at the company because they will be having too much fun and and will have learned too much to want to leave. And if you look at code staffing, uh, my partners, Marcus and Ellen, they've got some people at the company who've been there with them pretty much since the beginning. I see that a lot in, in companies that are very open and you know, I think the word empowering is a bit overused, but where people can be responsible and they can come back and say, why don't we try it this way? Right. Or why are we doing this? Could we do it this way? And and I've, I've seen that. And it's interesting to me how, I, because I see that from the outside, right? Like, and I see a lot of employers, big, small, medium size, whatever. Right. It's very interesting to me how that infuses the entire culture and they're literally more pleasant spaces to be in. I got to tell you at, at flash at my first company, you know, 
we had what we called the promenade. It was a big empty area because all of our offices were window offices. And in that promenade, one time we had tra- we had three training rooms. So this was back in the day when you got a Dell monitor. It was in a really big box, right? And, and we had g- refreshed all of the computers in the three rooms. So we had like 40 computers and big monitors that had been put in. So I walk in one morning and in the promenade is a fort. They had taken, they, some of the people had come in at midnight and had built a fort complete with taking like tubes and putting broken CDs so they could, you know. <laughs> and then they all had Nerf weapons. And I walked in and I got attacked like he's <laughs> never been attacked. And it was just the greatest, one of the great moments of our history was yep. when that happened. And, People, you know, everybody had keys and the alarm code. And so they just decided we're going to go in and we're going to build the biggest fort known to man. And and just, it was <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I think people remember those things forever. Remember when forever. we got someone going to do that? Absolutely. Do you, let's, I want to talk about justice for me for a minute, because mm-hmm. I think that is such a remarkable I thought it was such a remarkable idea and so incredibly valuable to people who are a little underserved. And I, as I sit in my consulting role for employers and I interact generally with people when they're not in a good place, right? They've had an accident, there's an illness, there's a whatever. Um, But what I see is that there is a large segment of the population that doesn't have access maybe to a free resource, but really doesn't have a lot of disposable income. Mm -hmm. Um, And justice for me helps people solve small legal matters so they don't become big legal matters. What was it? How did you arrive at that? So, yeah. So let me, let me, uh, so it was my my second startup, the one before Justice for Me, was a software for the casino industry. And in doing that with my partners, who I'd also known for a long time, um, we needed a lot of legal help, particularly intellectual property help, um, because we were integrating games onto the web platform and all these different things. So, but when we went to attorneys in the Bay Area, we were located in San Rafael at the time. The cost of these attorneys were just insane. Um, Good attorneys, but you know, when you're self-funding something, you know, spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on attorneys before you even can start, is it's it's a Mm non-starter and so when we built that up we decided that between the all of us we had almost 80 years worth of experience in the industry we had a lot of legal documents that we had been involved with over the years so he said you know we're just going to have to do it ourselves and i'm not recommending this for anyone but um and then you know if and when we're if we fail and go bankrupt no big deal. And if we're successful and we sell the company, well, we'll have to restate all of the old contracts and do a stopples, et cetera, to fix it. But okay, it'll be coming out of the money from the sale, which is a lot cheaper than the money out of our pockets at the beginning. So that's what we did. And thankfully, we had really nice partners who didn't hold us up for, for redoing the, uh, the contracts. Anyway, So then we sold the company and we took care of it and everything was fine. And I was going around looking for my next uh, venture. And I was was providing mentoring for anyone in the Seattle area that heard about me and wanted to talk about, you know, what are they going to do? And in the same week, I ended up meeting with three different attorneys from different companies. One was from Microsoft, one was from Starbucks, and one was from Boeing. And they all wanted to leave their jobs because their kids were approaching college 
and they wanted to be free to go with them on college visits, et cetera. And so they all wanted to start their own firms because joining an existing firm would require that they work even more hours than they were working already. And, but they didn't know how to do it. They were just like, I've never done marketing. I've never done billing. I've never done. Yep. And, and so I talked to them about it and I said, well, if we started a company that helped you with all that stuff and took say 15% from, a, from the invoices that we generate and followed up on for you, et cetera, are you okay with that? And they're like, wow, we can actually charge only like 150 or 200 an hour, which is way less than they would normally charge as a partner in a law firm. And we can bring home a couple of hundred thousand a year. You can make money and we can work 15 hours a week and to have plenty of free time for our kids. So they wanted to do that. And I started work on it, but then I found out that legally we couldn't do it because the bar does not allow P attorneys to share, to split their fees, essentially, mm -hmm. with non-attorneys. So I went and I pivoted to something else. And I kept sitting there going, you know, there's got to be a way to do this, but couldn't figure it out. I moved down to San Antonio. And when I moved here, st strange story, I went on nextdoor.com. And there was a query there for someone who said, hey, does anyone know... Um, Microsoft small business server, my husband has to upgrade it at his office and we'd like some help. And I responded, this is three days after I moved here. I said, I've never used small business server, but my team at Microsoft wrote part of it. So, you know, I'm happy to come out and see what I can do to help or to meet a new neighbor. And I walk into the office and he sits me down and he says, I see you've been, you had tried working on this attorney thing through LinkedIn. And I said, yes. And I explained to him all my issues. He said, oh, I've figured out the way to deal with it. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah. He said, let's go grab lunch and let's talk about it. So we did. And that was the genesis of Justice for Me. I ended up taking my company and folding it in with his, and we renamed it Justice for Me. And, and basically the approach was, 40% of Americans don't have $400 for mm -hmm. a, an emergency. You have no idea people, how excited I am to hear you say that because I say that all the time and I'm not sure people believe me. Yeah, it's it's true. And, and you know, when most uh, law firms are small businesses yep. and so they need to get paid and the mm -hmm. way they manage it today is they ask for a large retainer up front, 40%, 50%. So if you're going for a divorce in San Antonio, which on average is four thousand is $8,000, they'll ask for four or $5,000 up front, which leaves all of these people out, right? And then if they go to legal aid, they're turned down because they make too much money to qualify for legal aid. Legal aid in Austin, Texas alone turns away 11,000 people a quarter. I didn't know making that. too much money. Yeah. It is insane. So what what my partner Joseph realized was if if we go ahead and provide legal loans, then we can actually take a piece of that loan and be stay within bounds with the bar because the bar lets Attorneys use credit cards, which take a percentage to handle the billing efforts, et cetera. So we signed up attorneys and uh, basic, the other part of it is a typical attorney only collects about 70, 75% of what they bill, right? Mm -hmm. They collect the retainer. and that, But then after the retainer, they're really bad at billing more or whatever and, and yep. all of this. So what we did and, and what Justice for Me is still doing actually is that they sign up an attorney. If, if the client can pay, the attorney works with the client normally. If the client says they can't, they send them to Justice for Me. We do a credit check. We give them a legal line of credit, say it's a divorce, up to $8,000 for this particular attorney. The attorney can start work right away. They do not bill in a retainer anymore because we guarantee payment. They do a month's worth of work and they bill, say it's $1,000. The client, the 
bill comes to us. We pay the attorney really quickly, $850, 85 cents on the dollar. So they're getting paid more than they usually collect. And, and then we turn it into a $1,000, 18-month loan at 10% interest. And so it's $60 and change a month, which is something people can afford. Mm -hmm. And if they pay it off in under a year, since we can turn the money faster, we refund all the interest. So for, you know, our first test case was uh, uh, someone who, uh, a woman with two kids who had gotten married in the military, they'd gotten divorced, they'd moved to another state. Well, they had separated, they'd never gotten divorced. Well, she qualified for a really nice sized mortgage here in San Antonio. At the time, it was like $370,000, which is a three, four bedroom house here, right? Yep. And uh, she couldn't close on it because she was still tied to her husband. She needed a divorce first, but she didn't have the $4,000 to put as a down payment on the divorce. So she couldn't get a house for her kids, right? She came to us. She went ahead, we we took care of it. Within two months, she had her divorce. She closed on the house, kept enough from the house to pay the rest of the divorce off, didn't cost her anything extra. And the attorney had an, a client they wouldn't have had otherwise. So it works for the attorneys because they can grow their business much faster. It works mm -hmm. for people. And the number of letters we got from you know, fathers who said they'd never have seen their kids again because they would have gone without an attorney up against their ex-wife or, you know, people thanking us for divorce or someone who is able to franchise their stores because they can actually afford a, a franchise attorney at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. it, it was just, it's an amazing, amazing thing. I, I'm always interested to hear how, because this is such a unique win-win situation, but I think even if you pivot into code staffing, which is not is not so personally dramatic to people, yep. you are creating a win for an employer because you're giving them well-trained employees who are happy to come to work and you're managing the training load, which in, in the technical world can be pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. You are helping a person who really probably just wants to go to work because most people just want to go to work. Exactly. And you're being very transparent about the entire process yep. that to me also seems like a win-win-win for everybody yeah it, it's it, it's i find it really interesting and and you know this is something i learned when we were doing the first business you know at, at first david and i just wanted to you know treat people nicely right Mm -hmm. And it was the start of the computer industry, you know, even before we had really reliable networks and servers and stuff, right? So for us, it was like, you know, helping business do business better. But what we learned as we worked with our different clients, et cetera, was that the, the more we could be, we could embed ourselves with them, be customer intimate, understand what their issues were and help solve them, the more it gave satisfaction to our people, to them, the more profitable everything was. I mean, we had, you know, large companies that I won't name that would come to us every year around October, November and say, okay, our consulting budget for next year is two and a half million dollars. Tell us what you're going to do with it. What a great way to sell, right? <laughs> It was, that was it. That was our entire sales effort, right? Our, our KPIs or what we now call KPIs were, were you know, we want to grow at 20% within our existing clients and then bring on one or two more. And if we did that, we were growing at 50, 60% a year. So, okay. Right. I, I think the combination of actually trying to help people and not trying to be a money driven oddly enough, brings in a lot of money. It, it's, you know, like I say, when I, I first met Bill Gates, I realized he never pays for dinner, right? He, he can't afford it, but you know what? If he's going to meet the mayor of Adelaide in Australia, chances are the mayor's paying, right? Yep. So it, it, it's just, it's an, it, it's an odd thing, but... You know, it, it also, you know, it drives you to come to work every day, 
right? Mm -hmm. The fact that you're making such a difference. Every time I'm on the phone, you know, with one of our people that we're recruiting, you know, I, and I tell them, hey, yeah, it's me. I'm the CEO of the company. I meet with every single person we hire because they have to understand who we are and how we are. Mm -hmm. And and then I tell them about our benefits. You know, the word wow happens a lot. Oh, right? I'm sure it does. And, you know, I'm like, but it makes sense. I'm like, th th our, our, I was talking to a new client and he was like, so you're telling me we don't have to pay a hand and a leg if we want to hire one of your people? And I said, no, no arm and leg. You know, you pay us a little bit, but not much. And the reason why is if they want to go to work for you full time, you'd better be offering them better than what we're offering them. And, yep. and you know, then I haven't done my job. So go for it if that'll make them happier. And they're like, you know, it's, it's just, but, but, but it helps so much because it means also that our clients are culturally aligned with what we're trying to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that cuts a whole lot of issues out too. I, we, we found that as well, that um, employers that find their way to me are typically like, look, we got this health insurance thing and it costs a lot of money. We're not wild about it. We'd like to pay less. But the more pressing problem is that nobody can use this thing. Do you think you could fix that? Those are our right. people. Right. And it's, I notice we, we can be so much more, we can deliver so much more with those people. Um, and they tend to be a little bit, they think a little bit differently about their workforce as well. And it really is lovely to, to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, ab absolutely. I mean, one of our, our big client now, you know, they they just the the CTO hated the cultural disconnect between the fact that they were winning awards for how well they treated their people, and then they had these contractors who are just not. not. So yeah. we we help fix it. So, and do you find that you will that being a contract employee? Yes, you're an employee, and you're getting these great benefits, but you, you they people feel a little bit more flexible. Yeah, you know, actually, the the thing I worry about every day and that I ask everyone in our one-on-ones is more, so when we have a full-time employee that we place at a, a customer, call them customer ABC, right? They are there 40 hours a week, every week, right? Mm -hmm. And and we, re, we reserve the right, and we do, we have, you know, an hour training class every week and different things if people want to attend and and every month there might be a two hour course or whatever. Um, but my biggest worry is how do we keep them tied to us and our culture when they are spending most of their time at a client inside their culture, right? Mm -hmm. And and it, it manifests itself in so many ways. If, if you have a client that has, you know, heavy security needs, well, then the people th they get, our people there will end up getting computer equipment from the client that locks them into the client network so they're not able to access during the day, say, our Teams or our Slack, where mm -hmm. we've got, you know, a bunch of people all joking together and learning together and having fun. Well, they don't see yeah. that, right, at that client and other places. So we work really hard to provide, you know, we, we bring everyone together a few times a year for corporate events. Um, you know, I make sure that everybody has regular one-on-ones with me or the account manager at the client they're at, or both actually. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the thing that I haven't, that I don't feel that I've quite nailed yet is what do we do? And, and I'm looking around at different products that are out there and what different companies do, but, you know, there's not a lot of literature on it because, you know, most of those companies don't care. And when you're a consulting firm, you're typically bringing the project to you. So you're still in your company doing it yep. for them. So this is kind of, the, the, this is the one thing, you know, I, I haven't quite 
nailed it. I think you'll figure it out. We'll keep at it. Yeah. Yeah. What would be your best piece of advice for somebody who's ready to move on from their first venture to their second? Ooh. Um, Make sure you... (laughs) So from from sad experience, make sure you track, you you put together your cash flow spreadsheet before you even begin. Um, You know, my my first company we had at one point just a huge amount of AR, but we didn't have any cash for payroll. And since we were so open, you know, David and I were able to apologize and we had people come up to us and say, don't pay me for the next month or two months or whatever till everything regulates. It was, we had people offer to give us money to cover payroll. Um, David, we told them we didn't need that because David and I both reached into our retirement accounts and, and and paid it. But that was the kind of thing that openness gives you. But every company I've started since, you know, day one, I put together the cash flow spreadsheet. <laughs> and week by week, I'm tracking that sucker. <laughs> so that's, so, you know, you always learn from your mistakes. The, the other thing I would do is, is figure out a mission and, and how you think it can change over time. Because, you know, like for this one, our mission short term is treat people with respect, right? Our, our clients, our, our, our employees, the candidates who are coming into us, et cetera. Our long-term mission is to become so wildly successful that we force the whole industry into that. But that's not going to happen this year, right? It's not going to happen next year, but it might happen in localities, right? So Mm -hmm. if we're in a big client and we're one of five of them and the other four see that their people at the end of their contract want to move over to us, at some point they're going to change and then, you know, we'll build it up from there. So I think we'll leave it there. And I think watch your cash flow statement is very good advice for any business. Yes. I know a number that have run into the same issue. Um, so we will leave it there. Thank you for today. I always enjoy our conversation so much and your perspective, which is a little different than many. Um, if you're listening or watching and you liked what you heard, subscribe, leave us a review, helps us spread the word, and we will see you next time. Bye, y'all. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Raising the Bar is powered by Altique Consulting, the country's leading independent expert in healthcare cost containment. Astute employers know there's a better way to offer health insurance, and we help them achieve it.